Okay. Here goes. This is the last, hopefully, increment in the financial analysis discussion. Now, now I'm talking about using history from our financial ratios to make a forecast. And we're going to see a lot of how to interpret the ratios, how to compute them. But if you have an interest coverage ratio, for example, and the interest coverage is the, the, the cash flow or AB divided by interest, we can see how low can the cash flow can go before we can't pay the interest. So if the cash flow is 50 and the interest is 75, then we can say, oh, we go to two times interest. And, oh, thank you very much. That's great. And then uh, 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 we can, our cash flow can go down by 75, take 75 divided by 50. And that's that formula that I insist on. But here's the problem, you know, well, if you live, you don't have any uh, history of project finance. Now, here's what I really want to do. And this is what they had asked me to do, and then I, turns out they just wanted accounting, but whatever. Um, you know, if we, uh, if we really look at a company, uh, well, Mm -hmm. That was really rude. We want to see really what drives the, the, the uh, prices and, and the, the, the fixed and variable costs. That's EBITDA. That's what we search to get. You know, and we want to, that's driven by kind of fundamental economic ideas of long run and short run marginal cost, CapEx life cycles, bubbles, you know, these are the kind of things you really have to worry about. And here's the big problem. If you've got a long period of economic expansion, you don't see just how much volatility they can be. An industry analysis doesn't, you know, the financial statements don't really give you much on industry analysis, again, especially in a period of economic expansion. And nowadays, people don't go back to 2008 even. And then we can look at competitive advantage in the industry. You know, do you have a bigger market share and all that? That's what we really want to do to get our forecasts. Okay? And, you know, Standard & Poor's again tries to do that and all this stuff. Okay. Uh, here, you know, that we want to understand cyclical industries. Industries that have a big downturn. In, in a recession, the danger is that producers, this one, will, will start uh, to produce a lot when it's at the peak. Because when things are going really well, you have a lot of investment, you want to you win. You want to get more market share. They made that point. That's pretty, pretty good. This example, and I try to find this, is, you know, here, rates to move a 20-foot container from Hong Kong, 12,000 to 220. My God. I don't know where I got the Financial Times, but my God. You know, that's an example of surplus capacity in cyclical industries. Okay, and there are all kinds of stuff here. You know, and that's what we really want to see. That's why I really love to see um, uh, long term history as well. Now, the whole thing starts, I'm doing it again, with, with demand volatility. And the economic, uh, uh, just demand in the economy goes up and down. But we need to understand what happens when we have some demand volatility. Because when demand volatility drives price volatility, and that's the big one, we want to see what happens with prices. And then on the cost side, we want to see if we have capital intensive or more important operating leverage in our assets. Okay. Operating leverage is pretty clear, but that's fixed expenses that don't vary when the sales go up or down. You really need to understand what's fixed and variable. Okay. 
<sighs> this is some qualitative risk bullshit. Let's get out of here. Now, um, I'm just going to show you what I did. I showed, I had another video on this. Probably nobody looked at it. But here's what I really tried to do with this one. I said, let's see if we can, can create a computer simulation model that shows how the price is driven by the difference between short run and long run marginal cost. That means if you have a whole lot of variable costs relative to your long run marginal cost, that's kind of operating leverage. The other big deal is what happens if the long run cost of the technology, like cameras, PCs, um, planes, just about anything falls over time. About the only thing that doesn't fall over time are things like services, things like getting a haircut, unless you're me and have not much hair left. But other people, you know, those, the percentage of money you spend on a, a, a somebody cutting your hair is probably the same as it was 100 years ago. The percentage of t money you spend on a car house closed, all that has declined dramatically. So it either goes down or, or, or stays the same. We have to understand if the price is going to go down because people make new things more efficiently. And if you have old assets and they're long-term assets, it kills you. There's less demand volatility. There's less of all this cyclicality that we talked about. This potential for companies to be idiotic and overbuild is the real disaster. That's the disaster that caused the, the real the real disaster the real disaster that caused the, the let's let's look at stock prices go to my uh, uh, disc why in the hell nobody ever looks at this I think it's so important on the the, the, the chapter number one you go to stock prices download and I try to put something reasonably current on in May and this is not very current but this is just a general kind of list of stock prices. Now, um, just a minute, that might take a second to uh, upload. Uh, upload, open, god damn it. Uploading is what we're going to talk about. If you want to know how to make one of these, these are called user forms. I made another thing. They're, they're easy. Now, the, hard, the, 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 the real key to this is to get the data. That's using workbooks.open. And then you can clear sheets and click it, and it will. You just put your little stock symbols down here, and it'll go get them. So I got some various stocks, you know. And then you can, for each stock, this is just the S and P 500 in total. And this is what I want to tell you. This was the dot Bob Bob dot dot com bubble. No, not really. It was the telecom disaster. It was everybody over-investing in telecom. It was a surplus supply of telecoms because people over-invested in it when it came down. If you don't believe me, let's look at some telecoms. That I don't count Apple as a telecom. Here, some, some regular old ones. Well, Nokia is a bad one, but we can look at what happened to them. Okay, and then the, the dates adjust automatically. It uses index match offset to adjust the dates with some indirect to pull them because you put all the stock prices when you download them from the from the from the workbooks dot open and there are about twenty five videos on that so I'm not gonna go through it too much but you download that and then you have this enormous you can't even see the little thing here. Look at how much Nokia went up and then down and then it went up again two thousand eight crashed down. Okay, you had a big surplus supply. That was a whole lot more than the overall market. How about U.S. Cellular, whoever they are? They had the same kind of thing, stronger than the market. Not that stronger than the market. They have had some problems. Let's look at Vodafone. Vodafone's kind of interesting because they've managed to get back up to where they were. That's shocking, really. Um, let's look at British Telecom. But you can see an oversupply. You can see a dramatic oversupply, and then this one, and the beta is 0 0.77. What a joke. This British telecom has lower beta than the average because of the statistical way the beta does. What a ridiculous thing. Okay, Sprint. Let's look at that one. OK, 
day. If that's well, now, it's gone way down. And then, if you want to look at the distribution to see if it's really normal, it never is because you know you have a little more here. That's that's not so unnormal. But if you you know want to look at the, the oops, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to change the, the thing. Let's let's go back and just get the S and P 500. Okay, so that this whole exercise was meant to show you how the real issue in modeling is the industry analysis and oversupply. Stock distribution, I just kind of did that, so huh. it's not normal, but what the hell, whatever. People get so upset about that, okay. It's had a return of 7%, which is an enormous return. Enormous. Because it's so much more than the growth rate of the economy. If you want to look at some other ones, let's look at... Uh, I should have put that little drop-down box on there. Let's look at what happens if you would have invested in GE. Then you, if we go to the stock distribution, you... Oh, the, here, I did it here. This is uh, GE's stock distribution. What, 10% return. Let's look at a boring old utility company. That's called Ed, my name, Con Edison. And this is what drives me completely crazy. 11% return, oh my God, over a long period of time, since 1970. We've got enormously rich because these people are just charging too high rates. Oh my God. Okay. Is, is this maybe it's bigger? Well, let's compare it to Apple. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Apple. Well, Apple, you would have got a little higher return than the the, the, <laughs> the stock, but not much. Considering. Okay. Shows you something about investing, maybe I don't know, or 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 economies. Okay. Now, so how do we look at this whole business analysis? How do we look at this potential for those telecoms to have that big decline? Well, demand. You know. It can be a little volatile, but then the real problem is prices. And do people overbuild? And if they overbuild, you know, if, in, as soon as you build the price change, that would be okay. But if you're building a hotel, a uh, 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 long line, anything, just about anything, there's a reaction. You, there's no, there's a lag. Now, the lifetime of assets is important too, because if these assets were all really short term, then the whole the whole market would just restabilize really quickly. The danger is long-run assets. And the final thing is, you know, what happens to prices when there's surplus capacity? And that's, it's hard to really see. But prices theoretically can go down to short-run marginal cost. Prices theoretically have to be at long-run marginal cost if you're going to ever encourage people to build, but they can go way down if there's a big surplus capacity. So there's some modeling stuff with that so we you know put different kind of uh, assumptions about short run long run marginal cost and obsolescence case to show what could have happen there a really high leverage operating leverage case a really low leverage case that's really the things that drive everything and then we have the this, if you have more surplus capacity or less surplus capacity, what happens to the price as a percentage of mar short run marginal cost or long run marginal cost? And I put all these little things in. Now, I started with a really boring case. Everything's flat. The price is just flat. No volatility, no nothing. The price, and this is because the price curve is flat and everything else. Now, if we start to change things, we make a little bit of moderate reaction to the thing. Now the price still stays flat because uh, we don't have any lag in construction. If we put a lag in construction, it still stays flat and that's because there's no variation between the, the, the price and the thing. But now here we've got a little bit of demand volatility that I said, okay, the demand goes up and down. Where's the demand? Here the demand index is going up and down. Um, if I want to, this is what standard and course, pours, pours, if we want to put a, a bigger kind of reduction in demand, we can kind of see what happens to the price, a bigger increase like that. So, you know, what happens here is basically the 
prices kind of going down to short run marginal cost and then going up. Now, here's what you really have to worry about in your forecast. What happens if our product becomes obsolete? Or if this was our oil company, if we've got a big difference between long run and marginal, and that's what you have in the oil business because you have to spend all that money to drill the oil and the variable cost is just about zero. And then people are idiots and they have a high reaction. Then you have these periods of really low cost and high cost. The low cost goes away and the high cost. And if we, it costs, takes us two years to build, you know, we, I don't know how that really said. Now, if the life of the assets is longer, we might have these really long periods of horrible marginal costs. So I'm, I'm kind of scaring, making it a scary thing. But this is what you really have to worry about. You don't have to worry about the model. You have to worry about these are the drivers of costs. Now, here's what I did next. So then to really think about things, we say, okay, here's this wonderful graph. I hate <laughs> No, I love it in a way. Oh, let's get McKinsey. They're going to tell us it's a powerhouse company, and Harvard Business School is going to say, here's your whole objective in your life is to get a high return and take economic rent from people. The problem is, once everybody's here, everybody else in the world wants to be here. I've said this so many times. So suddenly this high return goes down to here. That's kind of really what's happening in our thing. And the danger of this, for me, this is the solar power case. This is clearly what's, what, what happened in solar power. Everybody wanted to be in the industry, so we go to our index chart. And again, let's look at some of the solar power companies, or I just have one. I just have first solar. The one I, uh, I hope people aren't working for them and getting mad at me. But, you know, we had such high prices. Your stock price would have increased by tenfold. Then it still stayed at sixfold. This is after the 2008 problem, and then everybody came into the industry because you're earning such a high returns, and then the stock price crashed. Okay, that's how do we model that? How do we model, and how, that's why return on invested capital is such a big thing, and that's why standard reports are it pisses me off. And they say, it's good if you have a high return on capital. Bullshit. If it's a high return on capital, you worry about it coming down. It could be too good to be true. You've got to be a little negative in life. And then technical obsolescence, we talked about this. Kodak guidebooks, good. Maps, obsolete. Newspapers, obsolete. Did I put New York Times on here? Okay, let's look at what happened to the uh, stock price of, of the New York Times. I think I, I thought I put it on here. Here, Blackberry, well, that's a better one anyway, maybe. Okay, we know, oh my God, it went way up 70 times. And then it came all the way down. Everybody had to have a Blackberry. Remember, I never got one. Um, I, uh, Motorola, another one, that's, they, they made all the phones that got obsolete. Now, they, they went really high, and they've kind of been around the market. Okay, thank you very much. And then we can, uh, where did I put New York Times? I thought I put this. Maybe I didn't. If I didn't, that's okay. EDF. Okay, I didn't. Oh, shit. That was stupid. Did I miss it? Well, I wanted to show you that would have been another not oh there it is. That's just another obsolescence case. Yes, I guess it really started getting killed in two thousand two. And then here's the market crash and it never recovered, not surprisingly, and probably New York Times is a good newspaper that's done fairly well. I don't mean it's a good newspaper, it's just done fairly well. Okay, so that's the idea you know and then the the technology risk this is this wonderful case iridium no, motorola that that motorola stock why that was so high and crashed they put all this investment into satellites here's what solomon brothers and all these wonderful investment banks said the revenues would be here's what they actually were <laughs> what a good case gdf suez here's what they had i love this company so I'm not going to criticize them. They had me do a, a course for them. And wonderful. 
Um, but they had some environmental problems and some other you know, problems, I think. Now, why did that happen? Now, if that happens, well, I don't know what happened with that. So we might have to start at 2002. This is all working with the offset charts, you know. So they've kind of underperformed. Now, we'd have to be a little careful. I don't know if these are in uh, euros and this is in U.S., so when you really do this, you better be careful that you've got the right uh, currencies. It all downloads from uh, Yahoo Finance, okay? And I should move on. I'm going to move on, okay? But those are some of the, some of the things that can go uh, wrong, okay? And I think we can look at them in an economic framework rather than a accounting framework. There are legal, political risks. I use the double plant. I don't bother with all that. Managerial risk. Would you really have a competitive advantage? Don't bullshit yourself. Do you really? What about hiding all that information like Enron and Constellation Energy did and all those guys? And here's the cost structure risk. We talked about having high fixed costs. That's the United Airlines and GM bankruptcy, I think, you know. Maintenance expenditures, if you have to have a high level of maintenance expenditures like airlines, that's really like an O&M cost. That's a fixed cost. Don't, you've got to understand what's a CapEx and what's, and none of those reports say what's very, what's really maintenance CapEx, okay? Then we'll talk about some ratios. I, I split the ratios into five classes, especially for credit analysis. How much buffer do you have? That's a debt service coverage. Debt to EBITDA, how much how long does it take to pay back the debt? Debt to capital, how much skin in the game do you have? How much stake you have? Liquidity, it's just can you pay the debts off immediately? And then this return. Okay, and we need to understand the ratios and how to use them. We can put them in default analysis. This shows the liquidity versus solvency. Liquidity, who really cares about most of the time? Don't get obsessed with those ratios. Talk about solvency ratios. How long is it time? Skin in the game, payoff, this buffer. And the specifics of the ratios are a whole lot less than, you know, what they really mean. Just computing a bunch of ratios, what a goddamn waste of time. Okay, and here's, so let's talk about the debt service coverage. I said that's, I got that wrong. It's a ratio minus one divided by the ratio. It would be a negative. Oh, maybe that's okay. Here are some standards for project finance. Time to repay the debt. It is not 20 times, does not take 20 years. 20 times would mean if the interest rate is 20, we take 20 times 10 is 2. 20 divided by 1 EBITDA would be negative 1. We couldn't pay the debt. We could put FFO to debt, but it would be a lot better. Put debt to FFO. That says how much can you pay after the interest. Okay. And so that's what this all says. I said it a little fast. Skin in the game is debt to equity, debt to capital, and all that. How it, It's... You know, it's really, there are two ideas. It, how, how well can the assets go before it, the debt's worth more than the assets? And how much money have you put in it? Okay, and then there's some peer group comparisons or whatever. And, and uh, Then I'm going to talk about ROE and ROC. And this is kind of the big deal with ROE and ROC. You put in a little minuses and pluses and you figure out what's associated with the EBITDA. If it's a minus, it's it's like net debt. If it's positive, it's associated with the EBITDA. On the same side, this I call this the direct and indirect method. And then I just use the sum product and prove that we get exactly the same number. If the balance sheet balances, you'll get exactly the same number. And then you can put, compute your operating income from the income statement after depreciation. Because... It has to be after depreciation because there's no capex, so we gotta see if we're covering our capex really, and then you divide, you multiply that by one minus the tax rate, and you get, and you should take the average of the open and closing balance. Okay, and if you're really gauging it, that's important. Now, uh, here's the big danger. I'm repeating it so much, but if you earn a really high ROIC, can it be continued? Or is it because you're in a boom period? Or do you have a price bubble? Here's kind of putting those things together.
And so I got some more stuff on financial ratios. Here's what Standard and Poor's and Moody's do. You know, they say, well, the FFO to debt, that should be debt to FFO. We could see how long it takes to pay back. And then they have debt to EBITDA. They're the same thing. Cash flow to total debt percent. It's all the same. Free cash flow. Oh, look, return on capital is higher. So we like these companies. It doesn't say that there's a danger of it coming down. So they do this, what, for industrials and utilities or whatever. That's irrelevant. This idiot, I'm sorry, this guy at Stern Stewart or whatever his name is, Damaradan, makes some program that's just comical. Just comical to say, oh, we can use this to predict the ratios? Are you kidding me? Not account for the business risk? Are you kidding me? He really does that. And then, well, here's here's what we should do. We should look at we, uh, what what's this one? Funds from operations. And this is where they start putting business risk together, or debt to capital. If we have a high business risk, we need. Uh, well, no, it doesn't say. This is just this is just aggressive. That's nothing else. Here's what I wanted to say. This is what they really seem to do. Now they have changed this. I, this was kind of nice. It was a little bit simple. They say, okay, if you have a three times coverage ratio, and this is a low business risk, that, but if you have a three times coverage here, you're rated double B. Here you're rated double A. If you have a four times coverage, you're a number two, you're rated double A. Down here, you have a four times coverage ratio, you're B. Okay, because you've got higher business risk. We take, take account of both the ratios and the business risk. Same for funds from operations to debt. This is debt to cash flow. We should reverse it around and see how many years it's taking us to pay the debt. 20% cash to debt, we're A. 20% cash to debt for 7, we're double B. So on and so forth. That was kind of decent. Of course, you have no idea. Then they have this silly thing here. This is one of the most silly things I've heard. This one. Everybody's high. Every industry's high with a couple of L's. There's no difference in any industry. How do we figure out who's really subject to, to, to uh, uh, capital intensity and all that? What a joke. These people. Oh, my God. What good is this all? How do we figure out what these business risks are? Here's the, an old thing from my nemesis company but they kind of did this they said here's our generation company that's a high risk company we have uh, FFO to debt one time so that's debt to EBITDA is about takes a little more than a year here debt to EBITDA is down, down now this is a distribution company now that's rated A even though the ratios are much much worse FFO to interest is 12 3 and that's because of the difference in business risk somewhere down here they say well it's it, here's the difference risk different business risk, risks this has a much higher business risk this has a lower one how could Dameron done, done that silly little exercise and that's the same thing they do kind of in project finance everything's targeted for triple b minus okay and all these things distort I, now i'm talking about things that can distort things ratios like goodwill uh, maintenance capex we need to know how much of the maintenance capex so if we don't expense it asset impairments is a really big one they all distort this stuff ah, and i didn't talk about it Okay, and then I have some other things, how you get the assets, and I think that's enough. And then I have some history of the defaults. This is kind of cool. This is the defaults in the different industries that you can get. Again, that's just on the disk if you go to chapter number two. Find these stuff. Here's the history of the defaults. Biggest default in each year, of course, there's Lehman Brothers, which I probably... Well, Lehman and Ford, if you added these two up, I think it would exceed all the rest of them. There's Enron, which is a tiny one compared to Lehman. And here's Lehman Brothers. They were rated A when they went bankrupt, double A when they first did it. So you can see this one was rated triple B. <laughs> this one was rated triple B. This is double B. That's pretty bad. Okay. They all of a sudden went bankrupt. Okay. I should put there the ratings, okay? Oh, and then we started again. So that's that. That's my last uh, 
I'll call this industry analysis. Okay? And that's enough.